Thank you for coming today. We have a full house, as you can see. I was a little surprised to hear that. Uh, my name is Perry Harrington. I'm a principal support engineer in the MySQL support group for the Americas. Uh, with me today are Mirko Ortensi, senior support engineer for MySQL at Oracle. Hi. And we have uh, another gentleman here to help you out with any technical issues. Andy from Menno Event Services. So, um, so, how many of you are current MySQL customers? Okay. And uh, how many of you are completely new to MySQL? How many of you are fluent with another SQL server product? Okay. So, I was actually anticipating that because when I talk to customers, the most common story that I get is, I've been an Oracle DBA or I've been a, a MS SQL Server DBA for the last nine, 14, how many years? And suddenly there's some change in the organization and they are asked to take care of a MySQL server. And they come in and they're like, I know Oracle, I know SQL Server, but this MySQL thing is completely different. And that is exactly what I developed the, the uh, tutorial, the hands-on lab towards, is uh, people who are familiar with SQL, but then they're said, management says, here you go. Here's, here's some MySQL servers for you to manage, and good luck. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, the presentation is actually divided into two parts. We only have about an hour, so uh, my plan is, the first part is I'm just going to do a little bit of talking uh, about MySQL and uh, some of the sort of more important things that you're going to run into if you're either completely new or you are you know, transitioning from another product. Uh, some of the people that are current MySQL customers may find this information useful. Uh, the second half of the presentation is uh, I have a, a set of 10 exercises. We may not get through all of them, but uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, primer to what you're going to expect if you're coming to MySQL uh, or you know, you're dealing with a cloud product or, or whatnot. So, uh, the first step I realized is that we need to get everybody running the virtual machine that I prepared. So, what all of you should see on your desktop right now is this. Now you'll have a variety of other virtual machines listed, but uh, what I would like you to do is to click on the HOL7298 virtual machine, and then click start. And yours will probably move faster than mine. And there's these little advisory things that they will pop up. You can just dismiss those. So to let you know, I I have prepared uh, a, an OVA virtual machine image that all of you can download uh, at a later time to continue these exercises. And uh, the presentation is also available. I'll share those links shortly once uh, we're up and running here. So if you want to follow along with the presentation, because the exercises will involve uh, typing in some commands at the command line, uh, it will be helpful to be able to copy and paste. So once you see this screen, you just click login. And if you haven't uh, maximized the screen already, then I recommend doing that. You may find that uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't scale properly sometimes. Uh, that's an artifact of VirtualBox. You have to you have to minimize or you have to reduce it and then hit maximize again, and then it'll pick up the change, and then. So 
the virtual machine image I prepared with sort of a, uh, an intro, it's a manifest, I guess you could say, uh, describing what's, what is included with the virtual machine and uh, some helpful uh, information. So the presentation is available at, oops. Has everybody been able to open the virtual machine and get it set up to the browser popping up with that? And if you want to take a picture of that, that's the URL uh, for the virtual machine image. It's 2.3 gigabytes, and uh, you should be able to download it. Uh, it's on Google Drive, so. Who said that? Ah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so unmaximize the window and then maximize it again. Yeah, there. Yeah, these screens, <laughs> I was a little surprised at the resolution. So, I still need help with uh, loading up the PDF or the web browser. If you didn't raise your hand and we have two gentlemen in the back that can help you. I 
Okay. So, the, uh, the primary focus of this, uh, this is taken directly from the uh, catalog, uh, but uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're really going to focus on sort of the, the basics. I'm not going to touch on number five too heavily. Uh, we do have a product and there is another hands-on lab which does discuss MySQL Enterprise Monitor. It's a, a fairly uh, in-depth product and it's too much for us to go over today in just an hour. But uh, the exercises do cover uh, the backups and security and just the general uh, you know, getting to know MySQL. So what you're going to encounter uh, as somebody new to MySQL, there's two scenarios that I expect you to, to, to be uh, presented with. The first one is, hi, so you, know, you need to go and build us some MySQL servers. You're going to be given an edict without any explanation, and somebody's just going to say, here's some hardware, and your IT department is going to install Linux on it. And they're going to give you, most likely, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. Uh, today. That's the most common platform. I know that some uh, customers use Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. Uh, the presentation is geared towards 7 uh, simply because that's more common today and uh, my recommendation is if somebody gives you a choice, say I want Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 because from your standpoint of managing a system, it's going to be a lot easier to keep up with package updates and uh, just the, the general DBA aspect. Uh, so the next question you're going to be faced with when you have a, a bare platform, whether it be a virtual machine uh, or an actual you know, hardware uh, machine, RPM or tar.gz, and this may seem like a sort of esoteric question, or for some people it may seem obvious if you're familiar with Linux. Um, so RPM is the Red Hat Package Manager. This is how Red Hat manages all the software. So if you're familiar with Windows, you know Windows goes through updates, and how much of an absolute pain that is, and how difficult it is to manage a Windows system. RPM, on the other hand, uh, pretty much solves all of your problems. Uh, it makes your life easy. Tar.gz, so to, to give you a, uh, some background, Tar.gz is what we call, that, that's our shorthand for a standalone build of MySQL. It's an actual tar.gz file that you download and you can just unpack into a directory. There are times where that is valuable if you, you know, if you have uh, some sort of, you know, internal version control uh, that policy prevents you from updating system packages, you can download a tar.gz into a non-privileged directory and you can simply unpack that and it's ready to go. You just start MySQL, point it to a configuration file and it's ready to run. Uh, the, the biggest challenge that we find with tar.gz is people don't update. Now, you would not, you know, I think you might be surprised, but, you know, some customers or you know, companies, I should say, it's not uncommon for, uh, for a product to be, you know, and, and when I say, if you are familiar with another product and suddenly you are now a MySQL DBA, what will happen is somebody will give you a server that's already been built and you'll be asked to take you know, control of that, of a legacy product. And I would say that 50% of the legacy products that we encounter are using tar.gz. And the problem with that is, is that how do you know where it's installed? You know what what has been updated. You know it, it's really hard to control. There is no real control over Tar.gz from you know the standpoint of you know uh, deployment. It, it can be done right, but it is more difficult than simply using RPM packages if you have you know Red Hat Linux. So the next thing, and I'm kind of belaboring some of these points, but they're important to make your life easy. If you're going to be a MySQL DBA, you want to actually, you want to spend your time solving the hard, the hard problems, not 
solving the easy problems. And so, uh, young or not too young. And the, the real question or simple, you know, short one of that is, if you're using uh, the community packages, which if you're an Oracle customer and you have a MySQL support uh, entitlement, you can use community packages if you don't need the enterprise features. So if you want to use our community young repo and deploy, you know, 100,000 servers and just have them update from the public young repo, then you know, you can do that. If you don't want the enterprise features, if you do want the enterprise features, it makes things a little more challenging. There's two routes to go with that. We offer a package where for companies internally, they can set up their own internal young repo and with our package and keep it up to date and then set up all their servers to point to that. There's a little more complexity to that and that is why I have put a link here. If you're an Oracle customer, we have a knowledge document on how to set that up. Uh, this is, you know, it's in the uh, presentation, so if you remember that URL, you'll have that. Um, suffice it to say, uh, the enterprise packages, they just come as RPMs. And we do have instructions online where, you know, there's an actual command you can copy and paste to install those. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster on these. So, Cloud Instance or Clone VM. Uh, so, it's very common with enterprises to use virtual machines like with VMware, for instance. It's also another common practice to build a master image of a virtual machine and then deploy multiple cloned copies of that master image. From one person's perspective, that's great. It's a panacea. But if you don't do it right, you're going to run into some big problems. And the one problem that we run into, and this manifests in number five, monitoring, is that when you clone a VM, if you don't have a script that goes in and sets up to make sure that VM is unique, which specifically SSH private keys. So each server, uh, when you create a server, you install Linux and you install the SSH package, which uh, how many of you are not familiar with SSH? Okay, so when you install SSH, there's a set of unique server private keys that are generated, and if you clone the VM, those private keys are identical among all of the clones. MySQL Enterprise Monitor uses the SSH key as a unique identifier when reporting back to the uh, monitoring server, the service manager. So if all your virtual machines look the same, you know, the whole world becomes upside down as far as MySQL Enterprise Monitor is confirmed. So you have to make sure that that's, a, you know, that's something important when working with your IT groups for deploying virtual machine images. So the next thing is, this really comes down to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 or Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 uses System D instead of Upstart for managing all of the system startup scripts. It changes some of the syntax a little bit, if you're not familiar with System D, I recommend that you do a little bit of research. Play around with this VM because the VM, uh, while it's based on Fedora 26, it's very user friendly and it gives you a safe place, you know, to play with uh, System D for start, stop, etc. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 uses System D and. Uh, it, it's enough different than the usual that it's worth mentioning. Um, so, MySQL uh, uses a configuration file just like every other you know, product out there. The my.conf, which is included, it's, this is sort of the, you know, the basic, it's included in the slash etsy directory on a Unix system. Uh, there is a challenge in that on some systems you may have uh, a my.cnf file in another directory, and MySQL does check multiple directories, and it overlays settings from multiple directories. So it may seem a little unintuitive, uh, but the, the slash usr directory is actually another common place that we use to ship the my.cnf file. I don't know why. Everybody uh, scratches their question, you know, scratches their head, and says why. Um, but uh, now you can also have your own MySQL configuration file. Why that would be important is that you can set up a password and a login in your personal my.cnf file. 
So uh, there's instructions about that online, but suffice it to say that that is possible, and there's a um, there's a utility for uh, you know, obfuscating a password and, and saving it uh, in, for your system login. Uh, for automation, it's commonly used. So if you have a .my.cnf for the MySQL user, and then you have a number of automation scripts that you run periodically, then using the MySQL users .my.cnf in the home directory is uh, is very you know useful for that. Um, security. If you follow the security releases, uh, you know, for products, you might have noted one, you know, better part of a year ago for MySQL. The my.cnf file, it can be readable by everybody, and it is, but it can only be owned by root. If you don't maintain root ownership of that file, of the, the main MySQL file, you can open yourself to a variety of attacks, and there was a bug that was exploited you know, I can't remember. There's these goofy names that they give, but suffice it to say that uh, the default permissions are safe. Don't change them. <laughs> um, so MySQL stores its data in a directory. Uh, a lot of other database systems, they use actual raw disk volumes for storing data. And MySQL is not designed that way. It's designed for its data files to be stored on the file system. So in MySQL, we have something that's called a table space, uh, which is analogous to uh, you know, a, raw, a raw disk volume in another database system. And table spaces are what actually store the table data itself. There is what we call a system table space, which stores what's called the data dictionary. I'm kind of going real deep in here, but suffice it to say, you'll find files that start with IB for NODB. And you'll have the IB data one and, and a few others, and those are stored in the data dir, which is, it, it sounds funny, but data dir is just the actual configuration name that we use. It's the data directory. Now, why this is important is, it's very common when somebody sets up a new MySQL server, they don't want to use the default location. The default data there is slash var lib MySQL. Uh, a lot of times they'll allocate you know, a terabyte of storage on a SAN or something like that and put it in slash MySQL. They'll copy files over and then start it up and, hey, it works, whatever I started is root, but how come when I try to start it with you know service or system D, it doesn't work? That's because if you don't have SE Linux disabled on MySQL or on the, the server, it will prevent MySQL from accessing it. Now, I won't go into the super specific details other than we do have a document on how to set up uh, all of the ACLs for, for relocating uh, the data dir. Uh, if you don't need SE Linux and you're confident in your network security, you just disable it and you won't run into this problem. That, that's um, one reason why we went to the tar.tc, because we put everything where we wanted it, and all the commissions are right, and you don't have to worry about relocating stuff if you do the RPM install. Yeah, and that's actually a common uh, point that I get, is the most common reason for wanting to use tar.gz is that the customer wants to put the MySQL product in a directory, something like slash opt, where the DBAs have permission to write. So it's not uncommon for the DBA not to have root access. So, you know, it, in organizations, there's fiefdoms, and IT has their fiefdom, and they don't want to give away root access unless it's absolutely necessary in some circumstances. So they will give the DBA a login on all of their Linux servers that they need access to, but they won't give them the ability to update the packages or move them. So what's very common is they'll create a directory slash opt that the DBA has right access to, and the DBA will install MySQL in that directory and all the data files in that directory as well. Um, I, I have worked in both environments where you've got DevOps, where the people that, you know, where IT and the DBAs are one group and there's no fiefdom, and I've also worked in environments where you've got the DBA slash software development people over here, and you've got the sysadmin people over here, and they don't like to communicate. And they, you know, there is a boundary that thou shalt not cross. 
So I personally think that you know whatever is productive for the business is the way to go. But you know those are business decisions. Um, oh, MySQL logs. Um, anytime we get a support request that involves why is something broken, the first thing we want is the log. Uh, that's the most important thing, the MySQL error log. The default location you'll find in your VM and uh, in most installs is slash var log, mysqld.log. Uh, sometimes it's in the data dir as mysqld.error. That, it, it, it changes all over the place. The default is var log, mysqld.log, but uh, suffice it to say, there are two things about the log. One of them is every error that MySQL encounters is in the log. So it, it's, it's the authoritative source of what happened. Uh, you know, my server crashed, or my replication broke, or uh, you know, something isn't working, or why is something happening, it's going to be in the log. That's the first place we look. So that's, you know, if you, if you deal with support, it's important uh, for us. That's what we want. Um, the other thing is when you install MySQL for the first time, the generated password is going to be in the log. Uh, and some might think that's a security vulnerability, but I'll explain later why it isn't. Uh, so your, your initialized password, you know, starting with MySQL 5.7, uh, all new installations get a randomly generated root password. So there's no more you know, MySQL servers out there that are publicly accessible without root passwords. Um, so this one, I'll, I'll touch on briefly. Uh, so MySQL, from a, a DBA slash system administration standpoint, has a number of ports. And if you're dealing with firewalling or something like that, there are uh, four ports that you would deal with on, say, uh, group replication, one on a classic server. Uh, the, the ports are documented. Um, I will say very quickly. The, oh, uh, so the default port is 3306 for all MySQL servers. Uh, MySQL X and XCOM varies. Uh, there, there is some, uh, well, it, it can be 6606 or it can be 13306. There's a variety, they're in the log. <laughs> we, we, there's a question, we can look at the log or we can look in the server. The socket location, um, so, who here doesn't know what a Unix domain socket is? Raise your hand. Okay, so a Unix domain socket is a file that exists in the file system uh, that acts like a normal socket, like a TCP IP socket, but it's at the file system level. The reason why it's important, two, it's fast. Uh, well, one, it's fast. Two, there's no SSL. So when any of the MySQL clients make a connection to the server using the socket, SSL is not enabled. That's not a security vulnerability, it's just, uh, it makes things faster. Uh, so anytime you're doing, like, say, a backup, it uses the socket by default, which makes things faster. Um, so there's three primary clients for MySQL. There's the MySQL client, the classic client, just the MySQL workbench, which we're going to be working with today, and MySQL shell, which is the newest member of the family. Uh, if you are dealing with group replication or NODB cluster, you will encounter MySQL shell because that is the primary interface for managing NODB cluster. Uh, I won't go into that today, but suffice it to say, that's it. Um, so. These are, so we have the utilities, which we'll use one today, but MySQL Utilities is great. Uh, if you haven't heard of MySQL Utilities, it's a collection of utilities that were developed over the time that do all sorts of really neat things. Uh, they'll, like for instance, compare two databases and tell you what's different, uh, or if they are different. Um, there's MySQL failover, which still has useful features uh, today, even with all the other products and, and replication we do. People are still using MySQL failover because it allows you to manage an asynchronous replication topology uh, very simply. And it has hooks that allow you to launch scripts whenever an event happens. So if your primary server dies, and you have a failover, then you can launch a script to say notify or change an application uh, configuration so that the application knows what the new master is. 
Um, but these are all the connectors that we support. Now, a connector is just the, the client library interface that talks to MySQL. Uh, we pretty much have everything covered. Some of them are a little more clunky than others, but uh, they all work you know, well. Uh, LibMySQL client is the oldest one. That's what, you know, if you've ever used MySQL at the programming level, that's the old API that uh, most people are familiar with. Uh, so high availability. I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people in here, that word is thrown at them, or if you're here, there's going to be some sort of context. How do I achieve MySQL high availability? There's uh, a little bit I can say about that. Suffice it to say, uh, we have group replication, which is the newest product. Uh, it's kind of buzzworthy. You know, uh, group replication can be configured with a single or multiple primary configuration. So a single primary, you would have one master and two slaves uh, as the minimum configuration. Uh, Multi-primary, each of the servers can be written to, and those changes will be propagated to the next server with transaction verification. Um, now, I want to caution that just because group replication has what's called transaction verification or certification does not mean it's a synchronous solution. It still can have replication delays. Um, there's solutions, I'm sure, uh, to minimizing that. Uh, and there's a good blog article that I, I read online where somebody uh, did some testing. And uh, suffice it to say, it's not a bulletproof solution, but it's pretty good. Um, NODB cluster is group replication with a metadata layer. So basically, group replication itself doesn't really announce anything. You don't really have a good user interface for group replication. NODB cluster creates a metadata uh, database in the group, and it allows you to store uh, the configuration of the group as well as it gives you a few uh, API functions to be able to query the status of the group and, and uh, hook into third-party solutions if you have one. Um, the, the third thing I want to caution is, as a, as, a MIS, as a new MySQL DBA, a lot of people will say, I'm used to you know, master-slave replication, I'm going to do high availability, I've got two servers. NODB cluster requires three servers because you need to vote. You need a quorum, and you can't do that with two servers. You have to have three. So the minimum, the minimum number of servers for NODB cluster is three. Same for group replication. So old school replication, asynchronous. Uh, it's a best effort replication. Data gets written to a log on the master. It gets replayed on the slave. It can be immediately or it can be hours later. There's really no control over that. We do have metrics that allow you to monitor how long, how you know, far behind the slave is, but it's asynchronous. Semi-synchronous replication is a best effort approach that predates group replication. There's a plugin that basically stops the master from writing until the slave has actually caught up to writing that replicate that, that transaction. So as you can see, you might have some troubles if you use that. Uh, MySQL router, just to, to be brief, uh, it's the product that works with NODB cluster to provide a, uh, a proxy. So whenever NODB cluster, uh, whenever you have a failover uh, from a master to a secondary, MySQL router acts as a proxy that allows you to redirect your application connections. Now, a lot of people have used something like a, a VIP, a, you know, uh, F5 Networks Virtual IP Appliance Load Balancer. MySQL Router works differently. The best way to install MySQL Router is to install it on your application server. So instead of having 50 application servers contacting a single VIP that then contacts you know, a pair of MySQL databases on the back end, you install a router on 50 of your application servers, connect to the local router instance, and then there's no single point of failure. And you don't have to maintain an expensive VIP product. Um, so MySQL does security a little bit differently. It's a little bit you know, uh, counterintuitive to a way that some people are, are used to. MySQL identifies users by the source that they connect from. So if, I, you know, if I'm at home on my dial-up, you know, not dial-up, 
that started its name. If I'm at home on my uh, my home network and I connect to a MySQL server somewhere else, it's going to use the uh, reverse DNS from my home network to identify me. So I'm root at my host. Now the reason why that's important is that you have another level of control. You don't just have a root account. You can have 15 or 20 or 100 different root accounts with a different specification on the user. So you have different passwords. So you don't necessarily share the same account among multiple people. Um, it, it does, you know, it, it can be challenging to some, uh, but suffice it to say, uh, it's one of those things you're going to run into if you're not accustomed to MySQL, the, the user app host. Um, passwords. So, novice users. Yes? Yeah, it, and, and the other useful thing about the host is that you can use wildcards in the host as well. So you can use a, a percent sign wildcard. A lot of organizations have private networks. You can, you can actually cordon off certain groups to different IP subnets, and then you can say, you know, 10.123.1%, and then only that group gets logged in through this one particular password. That's what, that's what we do, we skip the, the, the part of the domain in the entry, but in a certain sense. Um, or you can be using canon domain. Yeah, we recommend for production servers that you don't use uh, DNS, that there's something called skip name resolve. The problem is, is that every time a new connection is made to the server, it does a reverse DNS lookup. And reverse DNS is slow, and it's also, you know, can be faulty. So if you set up all of your user grants to be user at IP address, then MySQL doesn't have to do that lookup every time you make a connection. It's important whenever you have an application making 10,000 connections an hour, or 100,000, or a million. So um, disabling reverse DNS is actually one of the, the tricks to not only solving some logistical challenges, but also improving speed. Um, so MySQL 5.7, which we're dealing with, uh, it by default sets up a, a pretty secure environment. It sets the root password, etc. But there is a you know another utility which deletes what we call anonymous users. An anonymous user is blank at blank. And what it is is it's sort of the least common denominator. If no other users match, then an anonymous user account can match. The use for anonymous user accounts is for proxying. So let's say you have LDAP for your Active Directory, you've got an LDAP directory for you know, your corporate uh, you know, authentication. It's very common to set up MySQL with LDAP and then set up a proxy user for all the DBA accounts. So you've got your, your corporate directory, all the DBAs are in the DBA group, and you set up one account in MySQL, and they can use their credentials uh, at Active Directory with the one anonymous user or proxy account in MySQL. So it, it does have its functions, but you have to be careful because if somebody doesn't put a username and password when they log in, they can actually get into the server. And the, the, to combat that, you, know, you can run MySQL secure installation. It deletes the uh, anonymous accounts and you know, makes things copacetic. Um, I, I don't know, I, I included this warning message right here, command line dash p password. It, I don't want to belabor the obvious, but every time you use the password on the command line, it'll print this message. Uh, there are some cases where the documented syntax is to put a password on the command line, like some of the MySQL utilities, and they still print that. Um, so just to quickly touch on this, uh, if you run out of connections on a MySQL server, hey, you know, this server filled up and you can't get in, it's because somebody with super privilege already is connected. MySQL reserves one connection slot for users with the super privilege. If you grant too many people the super privilege or it's granted without care, then you can, not, you, you can lock yourself out of your server in the event that you, know, you get a, a query pileup. 
So you have to be real careful with that. Not to mention that super you know, conveys escalated privileges. Um, so I'm going to, let's see. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, I'm talking too much. Uh, we, there's really three solutions for backup with MySQL. Uh, we've got MySQL dump, old school, it's still useful. Um, lots of positives, there's some negatives. Uh, MySQL Enterprise Backup is the you know, solution that we prefer today. The, the main thing is, is MySQL Enterprise Backup is a, it, some people uh, criticize me, it, it's an online backup tool. So it allows you to backup the server while it's hot. It doesn't stop the server, it doesn't create a long running transaction. The only exception to that is if you're using my ICM tables. A lot of people inherit legacy systems and they've got old databases with my ISAM tables. My ISAM is non-transactional and in order to back it up, you have to, you know, you have to put a, a uh, you know, wait on the server and say, I want all, of, I want exclusive access to be able to, you know, get access to that data. So, you know, there, there are exceptions and there's no workaround for that really. There's old school workarounds, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so MySQL Enterprise Backup, MySQL Dump, and in MySQL 5.7, they introduced a tool called MySQL Pump. It is basically MySQL Dump on steroids. Uh, the main difference is, is that it has, uh, it really it has three considerable differences. The first one is, uh, and I hope this doesn't hurt people's eyes, You've got parallel table processing, so it'll dump multiple tables simultaneously instead of in one at a time. Uh, the th second one is it will dump user grants at a logical level, so it'll, cre it'll dump create user statements separately than actually dumping the schema from the MySQL database. Uh, and then the third one is it does compression, so it can you know it, it can compress. MySQL dump, you just pipe it into gzip and you get compression. So that's really, you know, nor here nor there. Um, it has the same limitations as MySQL dump, but it can be faster. Uh, so monitoring, our solution for monitoring is called MySQL Enterprise Monitor. Uh, these are some of the things that it monitors. Uh, and one I'd like to point out is what we call Quan or the Query Analyzer. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people run into is, I've got a server and I've got slow queries. Well, the query analyzer is a very handy tool that allows you to visualize and do an explain on queries. MySQL Enterprise Monitor will track uh, queries that are executed and it will keep a it'll keep a tab of all the queries and it'll order all those queries by the slowest query first. So it does some really neat stuff. And I've got some screenshots here for you. So this right here is uh, your main dashboard, and it, it's your overview of you know, your MySQL groups, et cetera. Uh, this one's been customized a little bit, but uh, this is, you know, it, it gives you a very visual experience for looking at your MySQL topologies and monitoring them. Uh, there's a replication uh, topology viewer. So in this instance right here, they have a group replication uh, group right here. Uh, as you can see, it, it says uh, online, online, online. And then they've got a replica here that acts as an intermediary to another server that's part of a replication group. So it allows you to visualize your replication topologies. If you're handed an environment where it's, you know, it, you're handed something, there isn't any real documentation, you're set here, go, you know, make it work. You want to understand how, you know, how it's configured, this will probe the topology and it'll give you a graph. Uh, so replication status, it'll allow you, you know, it's part of the dashboard, it shows you your replication servers, offline, online, etc. cetera. Um, useful feature like that. Uh, and then backups, so with MySQL Enterprise Backup, it's able to look at uh, the backup history table and then tell you in this centralized location 
uh, what your actual backup status is, if you've had any failures, or you know when the last successful backup is. It's very important to make sure that your backups are successful. Just don't trust that they are. Um, and then this is the query analyzer I was talking about. So to, to very quickly explain it, what, what it does is it distills queries down. It, it takes the unique identifiers out of the actual query and replaces them with question marks. So then what you get is you get uh, 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 well, it's escaping at the moment. Uh, you get a list of queries, and you have your you know, total, max, average, latency, uh, how many times, you know, number of rows, et cetera, execution counts, which database it's on. And it allows you to visualize uh, the impact that each query is actually you know, you know, making on the server. And then you can click on each query, and you can drill down and analyze that further. So you, you have ammunition that you can take to uh, a developer and say, your query is slow, fix it. Um, what, what's your opinion on the MySQL Enterprise Manager versus OEM with the MySQL plugin? Because we have a big investment in OEM already. Well, so the same group actually developed both. And OEM is a subset of MEM, effectively. And MEM, and MEM was developed in parallel, I guess, to OEM in a sense. My opinion is, is that having dealt with both, MEM is a lot easier to manage. OEM is less easy to manage. Uh, MySQL Enterprise Monitor, you install an agent on each server or you can centrally monitor it. Depends on if you want to monitor the operating system or just the MySQL instance. So if you're only interested in monitoring the MySQL instance, the service manager's built-in agent can monitor all of your MySQL infrastructure without any real you know, effort to deploy. Uh, OEM, on the other hand, yes, it does have an agent as well, but it's a little clunkier in my opinion. That's just my opinion. The people that developed OEM may have a different opinion. Um, so this is where we get to exercises, and I apologize for not having enough time, but you know, I was hoping for two hours and we got one. So uh, so the first exercise, and this is, I was talking about the log. Uh, so when we're, when we're given a MySQL database server, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to log in, but you know, where's your password? So if you want to follow along, you can uh, copy and paste this from the PDF uh, that uh, um, that I provided. If you just want to you know, have me narrate, I can uh, explain it. Uh, so the first step when you're dealing with uh, MySQL and, and all the passwords, like I said, this is just a simple command that allows you to find that temporary password. This is the temporary password for uh, for your virtual machine images. So if you just want to copy it off the screen, it'll make your life easier. Uh, so the first step is, is we have to change the password because this is a lot easier to remember. And uninstall plugin validate password, I'll explain. Starting with MySQL 5.7, the validate password is included on all Red Hat installations. So, uh, or any RPM based distribution, you know, uh, whether it's Red Hat or uh, SUSE Enterprise Linux. So what I, the first exercise is I'd like you guys to log in and uh, change the password to Oracle One Star. Great. Well, uh, later, uh, one of the other exercises is actually to, uh, to use MySQL Enterprise Backup. And the MySQL Workbench creates a user, and it violates the plugin <laughs> requirements. Yes. Yeah, it's. It, I, I understand why they, why validate password is installed by default, but at the same time, uh, a lot of people run into that same problem. 
Oh yeah.
minus 255 uh, that I've seen. And uh, the, there are certain, well, certain good reasons to use that. Um, yeah, yeah, the, sure. the, it's good in the sense that if you have, I really only think it's good for minus 256 and above if you have a full transaction identifier in the table of GTIDs. Uh, if you if you're using GTIDs, it keeps track of the last GTID that it's seen. And with master master, if your server goes down and you fail over to the other one, when the other server comes back out, replication will start and it'll automatically come up to date. So it, so if you have a primary and a secondary, you fail from primary to secondary, the secondary is that when the primary comes back online from whatever its failure is, it will start replicating from secondary and it will automatically come up to date. Center, and, the third data center, and or the second data center. 